When historians talk about wars, we tend to talk about things like campaigns, battles, sometimes generals, but wars are really fought by soldiers, and it is that experience of the common soldier that is often the sort of forgotten story of a war. And recently a viewer sent me one such story about an ancestor of his who was a private in the Union Artillery in the Western Theater of the American Civil War. His experience was unique, and the Western theater is relatively little known, and what we know about his unit, along with his service record, allows us to see the war from the unique perspective of one of its many millions of participants. The Civil War experience of James William Burklow is history that deserves to be remembered. James William Burklow was born in Livingston County, Kentucky in 1841, the first of nine children born to Leroy Burklow and his wife Harriet. James's great-great-grandfather served as a captain during the Revolutionary War. His grandfather had served with Andrew Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans during the War of 1812 before moving the family to Kentucky. James was a farmer, but on September 25th, 1861, he enlisted in the Union Army. He was described as being five foot, eight and a half inches tall, with black hair and eyes and a dark complexion. The time and location of enlistment are likely not a coincidence. The war had started in April, but Kentucky, a border state, had economic ties to both the Union and the Confederacy. They refused to take sides. Instead, Governor Brian McGoffin wanted Kentucky to remain neutral, both to preserve its economic interest, and because being a border state, he knew that choosing sides would mean the conflict would come to Kentucky. But neutrality was easier in theory than it was in practice. Eventually, Kentucky ended up with two different state militias, one that supported the Confederacy and one that supported the Union, and even eventually two different state legislatures, the normal legislature, which supported the Union, and a Confederate shadow government called the Confederate Government of Kentucky. The attempt to maintain neutrality collapsed on September 4th, when Confederate troops under Brigadier General Gideon Pillow occupied the Kentucky town of Columbus, a strategic location on both the Mississippi River and the Mobile and Ohio Railroad. In response, Brigadier General Ulysses Grant took a Union force to occupy Paducah, in the area where the Burklows lived. The Union would control the area and most of Kentucky throughout the war. The war had come to Kentucky, and James Burklow threw in his lot with the Union crossing into Illinois and enlisting. While the state was split, Kentucky statesman and congressman John J. Crittenden had one son fighting as a general for the Union and another a general for the Confederacy, Burklow's decision to join the Union Army was not surprising. More than three and a half times as many Kentuckians joined the Union Army as the Confederate Army. James Burklow mustered in for a three-year enlistment, and among other reasons to join, he would have been promised a $100 bounty for signing up. While he enlisted on September 25th, the company in which he was eventually assigned, Battery K of the 2nd Illinois Volunteer Light Artillery, didn't muster until January 9th, 1862. Battery K was interesting in itself. A typical Union field battery supported six cannons using guns that could be easily moved by horse and accompany troops in the field, typically so-called six, ten, or twelve pounder cannons. But Battery K, under the command of another Kentuckian, Captain Andrew Franklin, was relatively unique, being armed with ten small two-pounder Woodruff skirmish guns. The Woodruff gun, with a barrel length of just three feet, was built as a light gun to accompany cavalry. The pieces, firing canister rounds, could be effective and rapidly deployed, but were only useful if there was no chance of counter-battery fire by the enemy, as the Woodruff was grievously outgunned by the larger six and twelve-pounder guns. Never much appreciated by the Union command, only around 40 Woodruff guns were cast. The distinction light artillery usually did not refer to the type of gun used, but to a battery where all the members of the unit would be mounted so that they could move faster. This would have been somewhat fortunate for James, who brought his own horse with him, for which he would have received extra pay. While the initial roster of Battery K shows 92 recruits when they mustered in, in fact the addition of various people supporting the battery teamsters, blacksmiths, people to handle the horses. The battery could have had as many as 150 to 200 men. Conditions were chaotic as the Union mobilized. Grant complained to Major General Henry Halleck in the fall of 1861, there's great deficiency in transportation. I have no ambulances. The clothing received is of inferior quality and lacking in quantity. The arms in the hands of the men are mostly the old flintlock. The quartermaster department has been carrying on with so little funds that government credit has become exhausted. While Battery K was part of Grant's army, then unofficially called the Army of Tennessee, the battery was not involved in the January and February battles of Fort Henry and Fort Donelson, considered to be the first significant Union victories of the war. 
nor were they present for the Battle of Shiloh in April, the deadliest battle in American history up to that point. Instead, the battle was garrisoning the Columbus, Kentucky area, engaging Confederate guerrillas and participating in reconnaissance rides. This not only demonstrates the typical use of the cavalry to which the battery was assigned, but also represents the nature of the Western Campaign, where there were constant raids by both sides. Likewise, Battery K was on garrison duty around Memphis during Henry Halleck's siege of Corinth. While Burklow and Battery K were in the West, they seemed to be missing the Western Campaign. We can't get an idea of what life was like for James Burklow and Campaign. For example, Private James Bolton Rice served with another company of the 1st Illinois Artillery, Company E, also serving with Grant's force, and left a journal that described camp life. In December 1862, he described morning muster for an army on the move. At 3 or 4 a.m., the bugle awoke us. We tumble out, or rather up. Presently, the assembly blows. We answer to roll call, then some bring water, some cook. Drivers feed and clean their horses so that in a few moments the drowsy camp is one great thoroughfare. Breakfast is called. We take a piece of meat, a cracker in our fingers, and a cup of coffee to wash it down. Put our rations for the day in our horse sacks, roll up our blankets, strap them on our harnesses. Grant moved on Vicksburg, Mississippi, the last Confederate stronghold on the Mississippi River. By taking Vicksburg, the Union would control the entire Mississippi River, essentially cutting the Confederacy in half. While the Vicksburg campaign is essentially the centerpiece of the story of the Civil War in the West, Burklow's experience with Battery K shows how the actual fighting of the war was much more than a string of large battles. While Grant was moving towards Vicksburg, Burklow and Battery K were in constant operation against Confederate raiders and on patrol around Memphis. On December 23, 1862, he saw action at Ripley, Mississippi. The next day, he was again engaged near Middleburg, Tennessee. He was listed as being on expedition from LaGrange, Tennessee from March 8th to the 13th, where he was involved in skirmishes around Covington, Tennessee, which is about 25 miles north of Memphis. It was at that time that James received an injury, not shot by a reb, but by falling off his horse. Injuries are quite common on campaign. A study of the recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan found that a third of the injuries sustained by U.S. soldiers were not combat-related. Burklow was reported to have broken his arm near the elbow in the area of Germantown, Tennessee. While a brush with Civil War medicine was always a risky endeavor, the treatment for broken arms was usually a splint rather than amputation. His arm would have been placed in a sling. He spent about three weeks in a hospital in Memphis and then was assigned to driving a battery wagon, suggesting that he had lost his horse in the episode. In April, James was well enough to go on one of the more extraordinary events of the Western Campaign, one of the largest Union cavalry actions of the Civil War, Grierson's Raid. The brainchild of Major General Charles Hamilton, the raid by Colonel Benjamin Grierson's Cavalry Brigade, consisting of the 2nd Iowa and 6th and 7th Illinois Cavalry, with a section of Battery K attached, was intended to distract Confederate troops and do damage behind the lines. Grant needed to move his army to attack Vicksburg from the south, which also entailed crossing the Mississippi River. It was hoped that Greason's raid, along with the threat from a Union division under William Sherman north of Vicksburg, would distract a large enough number of Confederate troops to make it easier for Grant to maneuver. The 35-year-old Grierson was an odd choice to lead the raid. He had been a music teacher before the war, and despite having risen to the command of a Union cavalry brigade, he had no formal military training and disliked horses having been kicked in the face by one in his youth. The raid kicked off from the Grange, Tennessee on April 17th, included some 1,700 cavalry troopers and six of Battery K's Woodruff guns. As this only represented a section of Battery K, it is likely that James volunteered for the duty. Grierson's mission was to ride deep into Mississippi, cut the Confederate supply lines, and do as much damage as possible, and then return to the Union lines however he could was a dangerous and daring mission that, by the way, was the inspiration behind the John Ford movie, The Horse Soldiers, starring John Wayne, one of my dad's favorite movies. Grierson's command tore up rail lines, raided supplies, and skirmished with Confederate troops who, with little cavalry available in Mississippi, were largely unable to keep up. There was a brief mention of Battery K's two-pounder Woodruff guns. While tiny field pieces, the Confederates pursuing Grierson's cavalry often had no artillery with them, and the little guns that could deploy quickly had frightening effect. By splitting his command into raiding parties, Grierson kept the Confederate commander, Lieutenant General John Pemberton, confused as to his whereabouts, and Pemberton had to dispatch more and more troops to protect his rear against the Union cavalry. Eventually, more than a division worth of Confederate troops were diverted from strategically important areas to chase Grierson. Grierson took care to protect civilian property, which was not always easy with troops in the field, but his cavalry attacked many targets of economic value to the Confederate army, 
including capturing a trainload of artillery ammunition headed for Vicksburg. Battery K's artillery helped to secure a bridge across the Tickfaw River. On May 2nd, Grierson's cavalry made it to the Union garrison in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. They had ridden more than 600 miles in 16 days, killed around 100 Confederate soldiers and captured 50 more. The Raiders destroyed more than 50 miles of railroad and telegraph, 3,000 muskets and thousands of dollars worth of supplies and property. In addition, they captured 1,000 mules and horses. And more importantly, they had tied up virtually all of Pemberton's cavalry, almost a third of his infantry, and two regiments of artillery, leaving much reduced forces to face Grant. Grierson's total losses were 36 men. The Chicago Tribune said of the raid, Grierson's raid into Mississippi for boldness and effectiveness has not been exceeded during the war. James Burklow had been part of what Grant called one of the most brilliant cavalry exploits of the war. The surrender of Vicksburg on July 4th, along with Lee's defeat in Pennsylvania the day before, was considered a turning point in the war. Yet the end of the campaign in the West did not mean the end of fighting. James Burklow participated in numerous further actions, including a much less successful cavalry raid under General William Smith against Confederate cavalry under Nathan Bedford Forrest in February of 1864. James's enlistment ran out in 1864, but he re-enlisted. He continued with Battery K in numerous engagements until the battery was mustered out in December when he transferred to Battery E. He finally mustered out as a corporal in July of 1865. After the war, James Burklow married and did several things. He was a laborer, he was a farmer, eventually he was a mail carrier. According to the 1890 census, he had 11 children. But the broken arm pained him his entire life, and at one point he applied for disability, although it appears he didn't receive any money for it. Finally, in 1907, when he turned 65, he got his military pension, $8 a month. He passed away in August of that year from kidney disease. James Burklow's military service was certainly interesting. In virtually four years of constant campaigning, he never took a wound in action. In four years in the Western theater, he missed virtually every major battle that defined the Western campaign and yet was in constant action. His was just one story among the more than 2.1 million young men who enlisted in the Union Army. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.